Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, I would like to talk to you today about uh, the security of cyber physical systems, um, which are all the systems where computers control a physical system. Uh, you, may have, you may hear some of those being called IoT devices, but many other systems that are not commonly called IoT devices fall into this class, industrial control systems and so on. So um, I would like to start by thinking with you about an issue. Now, cybersecurity, let's see what I can move the slide, yeah. Cybersecurity is a service. And when you go to the circus, what do you want to see? You want to see the attractions, you want to see the acrobats, you want to see the lions and the tigers. Who are the attractions of cybersecurity? We are. The speakers that you saw today, the speakers that you see at other conferences, this is Black Hat, those are the attractions. This is my brother and friend Barnum Zapp on stage in Las Vegas in a room a little bit larger than this one, making an ATM machine spit hundred dollars bill on the floor. That's an attraction. That's an attraction. Of course, the crowd is cheering for this attraction. You know, ATM, ATM dollar bills, Las Vegas, it's all figures. Barnaby, unfortunately, is not anymore with us, left us uh, eight years ago. Um, this is Charlie and Chris. Charlie, we learned Chris Watson. Hacking into an FCAG in 2015. They picked up a journalist, Andy Greenberg, sucked him into that jeep, and drove him up the road from Rima. The funny thing about that is not the fact that Charlie and Chris hacked into the jeep. They are two of the best takers in the world. The funny thing about that is the fact that some colleagues at the University of California, San Diego, in 2010, had already done it. Their mistake, instead of sitting Andy Greenberg in a car and driving him off the road, they just pulled us at IT Police Security and Privacy in an academic conference. Nobody cared. So, doing this type of attraction, this type of, as we call them, stunt hacks, helps in raising awareness. Oh, and this is uh, my uh, former student, Federico Mazzi, doing a very unsafe thing, sitting in front of a half-ton robot that we were hacking into. No PhD students were harmed in doing this experiment, uh, I promise. Now, when we presented this research, as we will see, the research was widely misunderstood. And this is a theme. The theme is that our conferences, including this one, including Hackers to Hackers, if you go to Sao Paulo, including Black Hat, Deathcon, Hacking the Box, all those conferences reward attack results reward attackers. Why? Because we are hackers at heart. I always smile when there's somebody on the news in the security industry saying that they are a former hacker or a reformed hacker. Well, I am a hacker. Not reformed and not repenting. And I train hackers. So, these Conferences reward the top research because we appreciate the hacks. They are beautiful. Hacks are to us the same thing that a beautiful mathematical demonstration is to a cryptographer or to a physicist. They demonstrate something and they are beautiful like a poem. But we are not the same, living in the same world where we were living before. Our hacks back in the days resounded on IRC. 
cuts today end up on the front page of New York Times. It's a different world. Our hacks today impact the public perception. Some examples, and believe me, all of these examples were taken because they are very good researchers. I'm not criticizing the research. I'm using them to demonstrate a problem in how the research is understood by people. The first research is a research by uh, Andre Kostin, Gossin Year Trial. He picked up a protocol called ADSB, which is used in next generation air traffic control. I could talk about it for hours, but maybe that's not the point today. Um, and he demonstrated that the protocol had some weaknesses. Now, those weaknesses were actually design weaknesses. The protocol was designed like that, because in the way it was supposed to be used, those weaknesses do not count. So this research was way less um, dangerous or way less explosive than it turned out to be on the media. This is a dreamer, next generation air traffic control, vulnerable to hackers spoofing planes out of thin air. You cannot spoof a plane out of thin air, no matter how hard you try. Uh, you go Tezo. Um, did a research on aircraft hacking, and what Hugo did was actually very interesting. He went on eBay and he bought a flight management system. Flight management system is the device that uh, uh, controls basically the um, output pilot of the plane, plus other things. But let's not uh, let's not dive in that into that. So he picked up this control unit and he showed that it had a buffer over that he could exploit it. And then, you know, explain some of the possible uh, of the possible outcomes of it. Now the fact is that what he said was true, but it would not affect a plane flying precisely for the same reasons that a faulty flight management system would not affect a plane flying. If the flight if the flight management system for any reason goes out of service your plane is not in danger. There's a redundancy built into the system. So it, well, his research was the bank, but not the research itself. The fact that it was presented on the media, and I'm using here uh, uh, um, uh, a news item by Darlene Storm, who's a great journalist. She's great. I work with her on stories. She's great. Hacker uses an android to remotely attack and hijack an airplane, which was not correct. He had used an android phone to show aircraft tracking on the phone by looking at ADSB traffic data. It was not a part of the attack. But when we do demonstrations, we should remember that this is the outcome. This is the public perception. This is an Italian newspaper behavior that wanted to hijack aircraft using a smartphone. So the public perception that, uh, that comes out of this is the, the one depicted in this comment that is very, very old. Uh, you can see that it's old because there's a Bluetooth stick in this laptop. So it's at least 20 years old. And here it is saying, you cannot read it because of the beaver, but uh, it says, it says, Windows as detected you are where Airbus A320, do you want to run out of configuration? If that ever happens, the, the good answer is no. The safe answer is no. no. But obviously, this is not what is actually happening in this answer. Right? This is not what is happening. So why do these uh, cyber, secure, cyber physical security stories get treated like that? Well. For one, cyber physical systems are systems that people can see. We, computer enthusiasts, nerds, we forget that for many people, what happens with computers is already something mysterious. If it goes one way or another, most people cannot tell what the difference. So whenever we run out our beautiful buffer overflow exploit and open up calc.exe, most people are like, yeah, that's the calculator. 
they don't understand why it's, that's important what happened. But if you hack into, say, a robot as we did, and the robot moves, they're like, woo, this changes things. And cyber physical systems are actually very relevant. Our society depends on them. Electrical power, freezing air conditioning, every one of these systems depends on computers large and small. And most of these computers are networked, and if these systems are taken down, our society suffers. So people realize that these systems are actually connected with their lives. Hack into an ATM, and people will not really realize that's what, what's bad about it until you make it speak hundred dollars beyond the floor, right? Hack into a self-driving car, and people immediately realize, oh my god, I'm going to be sitting into that car. That car has no steering wheel and no brake. If the computer is hacked into, I'm going to be in danger. People realize that. So let me use my research. These are industrial robots. And um, these robots that are traditional industrial robots, you have probably seen them at least once in your lifetime, are uh, deployed in what is called a protected space. There is this cage around, and if you open the cage, the robot stops. It's an electrical switch, like the red big button that you can push to stop things. It's an electrical switch. Power is cut and brakes are activated. The robot stops. Whatever the computer is saying, the robot is going to stop. If you act into the computers of these things, you can damage what they are working on, but you cannot hurt people because people are outside of the cage. If people get into the cage, the robots are stopped regardless of what computers say. But these are new robots. The robot is called Yubi. It's a beautiful robot. It's designed to look cute to humans because humans are supposed to work alongside them. So you don't want it to look like um, to look like this. And Yumi is designed to be very safe. If Yumi touches you, it shouldn't. But if it touches you because a mistake was uh, happened or because an accident happened. It immediately stops. It's endowed with a thing called proprioception, which is uh, which means that basically it constantly computes if the arm, if the joint, is at the same position that it should be at, given the amount of power it was applied. If it's different, it stops because there's something that is resisting. It could be an obstacle or it could be a human. It immediately stops. So if you work alongside human. You cannot harm you. It's impossible. Provided that the software works correctly. And the software is designed to work correctly. But what if somebody hacks into it? So being uh, able to test the security of Yumi is way more important than being able to test the security of these older brothers of it's way more important. Because you mean stops because of software. And you want you to stop. Systems are automated more and more. And automation provokes fear. So the, there's a mix of older and younger hackers in this crowd. Let's see how many people have seen this film. This is Star. Uh, yeah, this is War Games, 1984. And for many of us, in my generation of actors, this was a very important film because it was the first film that showed a hack, a guy hacking into computers. For most of us, that clicked. Woo! I want to do that. years later, I'm doing that, and my government is paying me to teach people to do that, how to do that. I mean, 
like five years old we could never have imagined. So this film starts with a cup, and I'm going to spoiler it for you because it's not Game of Thrones, so you have no legitimate claim to not having seen it. But the theme of the film is not the hack. The theme of the film is fear of automation. In the film, control of nuclear weapons is transferred to an AI. This is what an AI looks like in my or filmmaker's mind. And that causes fear. An AI controlling automatically weapons, that causes fear. Well, thinking of who controls American nuclear weapons right now, maybe the 1984 artificial intelligence was not that bad. But um, the fear of automation is embedded in us. When you board an airplane, if you have fear of flying, what you feel is fear of loss of control. You cannot control what's going to happen to you. And so you experience fear. Fear of control and fear of automation are very much the same thing. Humans fear things that they cannot control. So, if we want people to use them uh, safely and to feel safe in using cyber physical systems and any cyber physical systems around them, we need to think. Some hacks have been very important in raising the discussion, raising the awareness. As I said, look at Charlie and Chris. They redid an experiment but they made the public aware of it, and they changed cybersecurity in automotive industry. That's very important. But sometimes focus on specific vulnerabilities. Um, and if we focus on specific vulnerabilities, we fail to do our job. This is a piece of the keynote by Dan Deere in 2014 at Blackhead in the US. If you have one hour of your life to spend for training, Watch this video from YouTube. It's one of the best cybersecurity presentations ever given. And one of the points in it is, do vulnerability, does vulnerability research matter? Well, we don't know. If vulnerabilities are sparse, if there's just a few vulnerabilities in systems, then killing vulnerabilities matter. It improves things. But if vulnerabilities are dense, killing vulnerabilities does not matter. It's much trouble than it could. And, and we don't know if they are dense or sparse, but everything we see makes us think that they are dense. There's a lot of vulnerability. So killing them one by one is not a feasible solution. Of course, we, we should do it. When we find a vulnerability, we should close it. But looking for vulnerability does not help. Um, this is by Bart Alberts, one of the best kernel hackers in the world, agreeing with Brad Spengler, the author of GR Security, one of the best defensive kernel hackers in the world. So offense and defense agreeing on something, isn't that, isn't that weird? No, because they are seeing the same problems from two different directions. What is the bad solution, squishing problems one at a time. What is the good solution? Denying attackers their objectives. We've known that in software for a very long time, and we, are, we still fail to do it. So what do we need to do in cyber physical systems? Not focus on the single vulnerabilities, but focusing on denying attackers their uh, goals. Because we are at a very delicate point in time. Systems are becoming more and more automated and more and more pervasive in our lives. People do not trust those systems. And they are very right in not doing so. If you think about it, think about your personal experience. 
with Penny and Frank. Penny and Frank expect computers not to work. Think about it. They expect computers not to work. It is broken. Oh, upload immediately. It's not something that causes surprise. In fact, most people are surprised when computers do their work. But it's very different if you are looking at them and, and those computers are going to drive your car. That's very different. That's the moment where you don't want to look at that car and think, hmm, let's see if today it works. So we need to restore confidence in the public and in our colleagues uh, that we are actually an engineering profession, that we make things that work reliably. And we are not like wizards making spells that sometimes work and sometimes don't. So, I don't have a solution to offer because otherwise I would be out there selling it and being rich. But I have a couple of suggestions. The first suggestion is this. We need to think systemically and not to think of a specific vulnerability. I will give you an example drawn from my own research. Now, in 2017, we presented a comprehensive attack research on robots, first at security and privacy and then at lack of innovation. Now, this is what the circus of, other, of uh, cybersecurity professionals shared for. We found uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, all of the components of this ro target robot, which is a robot that weighs half a ton and can kill a human, updated their software without checking any signatures or any checksums. In fact, you could upload uh, an entire file of zeros and the robot would slam it into the memory of its computer and try to execute it. Not only that, but uh, the robot uh, basically, um, the robot components downloaded these uh, software updates via FTP and they logged into one of the computers to download this FTP uh, via FTP this software. So we wonder how does that happen? Well, it happens because when the computers boot, when, the, when you turn on the robot, for the first five minutes, uh, access control is disabled. Just think about it. Somebody thought uh, that a reasonable way to update things uh, was letting everyone and everybody access every part of the robot without a user and a password for the first five minutes it was after it was turned on. Uh, another thing that the circus shared for, you can basically uh, write comments by just creating a file in a very specific direction of the robot from Rima. Another thing that the circus shared for, these are pieces of the code from the robot, uh, and if you are even at the least bit technical in uh, cybersecurity attacks, uh, this is a uh, uh, straight by the book buffer overflow. In fact, uh, this line of code is pretty much the same line of code I use as a counter example in my security 101 class. It's in there, it's in a robot that weighs up a ton and of which there's five or six thousand on the network. It's in there and it can be used and abused and we have used it to attack the robot. Cheer for cheers. But this is not the important part. This is not the important part of the research. This is the press impact that we got. Catastrophe warning, watch an industrial robot get hacked. Watch hackers sabotage an industrial robot arm and my personal favorite, hackers are remotely controlling industrial robots now. Ooh. It's our fault, we put online a video showing this, so the media actually got it. Now, this is the public per the perception, right? This is what you get from those files. Actually, now, the important part in that paper was not this one. The important part in that paper is that we reflected on what a hacker could do once they gain control of the robot we found that you couldn't keep them out of a robot. Because robots are very old pieces of software, are governed by very old pieces of software that will never be secure. What you can do and what you should do is design architectures of the robot 
so that even if an attacker corrects that, even when an attacker takes control of the robot, because that's going to happen, they cannot achieve their objectives. What are their objectives? A, uh, harming a human, destroying a product, destroying the robot. If you can avoid the attacker being able to do these three things, they can control the computers all the time they want. You don't care. You don't care. We are hackers. We are used at defending computers. But defending a cyber physical system is, defending the computers is irrelevant. What is relevant is that the system does not kill anyone or does not destroy anything. That's what's relevant. If we are able to do that, who cares about the computer? Second suggestion, since we want to deny those goals, we need to do that while the product is being designed. Let me show you why, using the automotive industry as an example. You remember the hack that I mentioned before by Charlie and Chris, right? You remember this hack. Now, when FCA found out this business happened, they had to react, right? They had to react. Uh, and this was not the only act. There's been a number of other acts. All these acts are actually always the same act. If you look at all the automotive security attack research, all these contacts about automotive, from the guys that broke into Tesla to uh, Charlie and Chris, every one of these acts is the same act. There are a number of ECUs of control units that are connected to the outside. You break into one of these, and from there, you are on the automotive network that is designed, predicated on one security principle. If you are inside the car, that's your car. That's how car security works. If you are sitting inside the car, that's your car. If you are inside the car's network, that's your car. So once you've broken into the network, everything can happen. You can demonstrate this a hundred times. We have a couple of cars that we use for testing, parked in our parking lot. And uh, every time we put a student to work on this car, they break something new. That's not surprising. We can do this all, all over hundreds and hundreds of times. It's not, it's not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that when you do this, uh, the uh, cybersecurity industry responds. So this is, uh, uh, this is FCA's response. They send every single owner of that Jeep a letter with a USB key. Say, stick this USB key into your dashboard and let the car update itself. Now this is awful. Because they basically trained their customers to slam into their car whatever they received via mail and let the car update itself. If these cars were fully self-driving, you would already have somebody printing out these type of recall notices with a program to have the car drive itself to the thief's parking lot. And it would work. We already know that it would work. If we can't do this, and this is just an example, I don't want to make too much fun of Fiat. They had a very difficult problem to solve, and they solved it the, the only way that they could. But um, as an Italian, I have a particular love, love hate relationship with Fiat, so it's nice to, uh, it's nice to abuse them sometimes. But the point is, when we deploy cars, or robots, or pacemakers, we cannot expect them to be updated. We need to be able to prevent this situation from happening. This situation should never happen. You don't want this situation to happen with medical devices. So you are given a choice. You can A, choose to keep your software untasked so that people can hack into it remotely, or B, run this self-updater and run a risk that the software breaks your pacemaker 
or insulin pump? That's a great choice, thank you. We need to make sure that this does not happen at all. And how do we do this? We do it by trying to make things different when we design them. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the proposal for making automotive, automotive networks more safe from academia, you see a lot of bullshit. And I'm an academic, I can say bullshit about my colleagues and research and my own. So, because for instance, you see things like, oh, and, and, and from ACME to conferences, it's the same. Suggestions such as, oh, PAN, which is the protocol that is used on basically any card network, unless you have a 1970s Panda to drive, that's, that's what is on your car as well. Oh, PAN is not secure. We need to change it. And to the, when you say change CAN, all of the automotive security people in the room leave the room. Because that's never going to happen. It's an impractical solution. It's stupid even to propose it. Or, oh, here's my magic intrusion detection system. You can put it into your car's automotive network, and it will stop the attacks from happening. Well, let me tell you one thing. In 2006, uh, when I graduated with my PhD, my thesis was on intrusion detection systems. They didn't work back then, and they don't work now. And they will never work. And the reason why they will never work is twofold. The first reason is, if they are intrusion prevention systems, systems that block attacks, uh, nobody in their same mind puts them in line in front of a critical system. So, nobody will put uh, your precious IPS uh, between uh, the brake uh, and the braking pumps uh, of the car. Because when I hit the brake, I damn well want the car to brake. I don't want an inclusion prevention system say, oh, that's odd, let's block this signal for a moment while I think about it. If you instead use an inclusion detection system that gives alert, you run into another issue. If the inclusion detection system that you built is very well trained and it actually detects an attacker invading the car's network, what should it do? Make a light blink on the dashboard with like a attacker with a balaclava and a keyboard so that you know that your car is being hacked. Uh, oil light, engine light, hacker light on the dashboard. And what are you supposed to do at that point? To just drive over and stop the car? Detonate it? What do you, what do, you do? It's useless. It's, it, all the research, and you have hundreds of papers on that. All the research is completely useless. Throw it out of the window tomorrow. And squashing the bugs in each of the um, in each of those uh, um, ECUs uh, is not going to work. So, how do we do this? Well, we can only do one thing. We can pick up what we have, the buggy ECUs that we have, the buggy can network that we have pick out all of the inclusion detection systems and firewalls that do not work, and try to design these networks based on risk approaches. You can actually, the risks to a car are very simple. A car is simpler than any corporate network that you have. The risks to a car are A, it gets stolen, B, it kills someone either on board or outside the car, C, personal information from the car are lifted. Those are the three risks. You can write an entire attack tree for those risks. And it's going to be complete. Any attacker will need to do those actions in order to achieve those goals. This you cannot do on a larger corporate network. It's too complicated. We, we always have attack trees, but they are too complicated. But for, the, for a cyber physical systems, they are not, because cyber physical systems are dedicated. They do not do everything, they do one thing, and they should do it well. So we can design this, and then we can use these attack trees to actually create topologies 
so that these actions that the attacker wants to do are denied to them. We can't do that. We can't keep the ECUs that are connected to the outside separated from the network that is actually connected to the brakes. And, by the love of God, I hope that we do. Right now, we do that most of the time. But only because the network that connects uh, the sensors and actuators of the safety critical systems uh, is a higher speed network than the other. And so they are separated, but just because of cost, not because of security design. We want to do that by design. And we need to do that now for vehicles that are going to be on the road in 10 years, because a car that is designed now is going to be on the road in five, 10 years. The cars that we are going to buy this year were designed before my colleagues at UCSB found out about that. The cars that are going to be built next year were designed after, but nobody cares. The first cars that are going to be designed after Charlie and Chris raised the alarm are going to be there in 2025. And if we act now, maybe they are going to be designed better than the other. So in conclusion, when we look at cyber physical system security, and it really be on security at large, but in particular, I think a lot about cyber physical system security. We think a lot about attack research. And if an attack researcher tells you that we think too much about my research, then probably I have a point. Vulnerabilities in the grand scheme of things do not matter. They matter as an exhibition, they matter as a stunt, they matter to raise awareness, but they do not matter. Some hacking is distracting the industry. It makes uh, companies like EDF knee jerk and send USB keys to their customers. We need to focus on building structural resilience in what we build, in changing architecture, and in particular, in looking at impact reduction. What does the attacker want to achieve? What are their goals? How do we deny them their goals? Not control of computers. Deny their goals. Deny their objectives. If we can do that, we can probably build a safer set of cyber. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. You can reach out to me through this email or Twitter. I like I love Twitter, so maybe that's an easy way to get in touch. But I am now happy to respond to any question you might have. And uh, before I turn over to the questions, um, there's one thing that I put here, which is actually the best explanation that you can find about me. Uh, my biography was probably read before in, uh, in Portuguese, but I couldn't follow it. This is an XKCD comic. There's a guy pulling a lever, gets a lightning bolt, and then there's two possible choices. A normal person takes away their hand and says, ah, you better not do that again. A scientist puts his hand on the lever and then says, let's see if it happens again. That's me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.